everybody outside. Yep. Wow, it's a nice outside. We are so thankful to have Susan Sensor and Diane Alexander here today to do a presentation on medical cannabis. Susan and I were at the Shine Bright Bash a couple of weeks ago, so she had these great big huge white glasses on that she was trying to read her presentation from, so I had to applaud her for that <laughs> wonderful It was topic. a 70s theme. Yes. I decided 70s was not that really attractive of a decade, you know. So, really? <laughs> lots of fringe, lots of hair. Yep. Right? Um, and Diane Alexander um, is one of the pharmacists at Children's. Susan Sensor is the medical director of the hematology oncology group there. Mm -hmm. Um, and Diane is on the collaborative as well, um, the group of all the pediatric hospitals, as we work on patient safety. Perfect. So if you need anything, holler. All right. Well, it's a, bit, it's a little bit of a, a chagrinning process to have become an expert in medical cannabis. This is not someplace that I fully expected to be as the mother of three teenagers and young adults. I, you know, <laughs> spent my entire, no, no, and then now I'm like, well, Hmm, let's think about this. I have to say that we put together this um, presentation because there was so much as we, as we realized that Minnesota was going to join the other 23 states to become uh, a purveyor of medical cannabis that we ought to at Children's have some kind of rules, regulations, policies, or at least some guidance for physicians and nurse practitioners about what they were going to do because we knew they were going to be asked to certify people. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about why is cannabis even considered in the medical field and talk about various pediatric applications that cannabis can be used to. And then we'll talk about how, um, what's the pharmacology and also then how are the um, programs and hospitals around the state, particularly children's, dealing with this whole world of medical cannabis. So cannabis comes from primarily from the plant cannabis sativa, and it has two major components. It's got THC, which is the psychoactive part. It's, it's what makes you high. And CBD, or cannabidiols, are the oil portion, which have more antioxidant effect. They really don't have much psychotropic effect, um, but they, um, and you would think, well, that's great. Just make a CBD only. We don't have to worry about people getting high. But in actuality, like many uh, foods or any natural product, both parts of the plant have some active ingredients that may have implications for medical purposes. There's also hemp, which is rope, which is the, basically the stalks of the cannabis plant. Marijuana are the dried buds. And um, one of the things that is confusing to me and that I think we're going to see more and more of is that as they learn more about the plant and are able to distill out the various oils, we're going to be presented again with a panoply of other types of cannabidiols that are going to um, uh, be maybe part of the medical um, armamentarium. But one of the interesting things as we started looking into this is that the, oh, thank you. Just could chat up here all day long, really, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, the cannabidiols are these molecules which are unique to this cannabis plant. Um, but one of the things that they learned is that the THC and the cannabidiols are just like we have kind of an endogenous opioid system in our body. There is also a cannabidiol system in our, um, in our body. It's a, it's a homeostatic kind of super modulatory system that um, the body's trying to stay in balance. And it is an innate thing, but, but then when you take an exogenous CBD or THC, then it uh, adds to that system. The THC tends to be more of the analgesic, the painkiller, um, the anti-inflammatory. It's when people get the munchies. It's the, it's the part we all have used Marinol for years to increase appetite for people. That's a THC derivative, and that's why I one time got a call in the middle of a night from a 12-year-old patient of a 12, a mom of a 12-year-old patient, like, something's wrong with her. She's eating me out of house and home, and she's going crazy. No, she was just gonna, you know, she just had the munchies really bad. But it's also the very anti, it's the very potent anti-emetic form. Whereas CBD is more of an immunomodulator, um, and it, it is the part that is the anti-epileptic, um, the anti-seizure uh, 
aspect, and that's what's getting all the attention. That's what's been on 60 Minutes many times. Next. So the cannabinoid system was discovered, it wasn't discovered until the 90s, which is kind of remarkable since marijuana has been around for um, centuries. Um, but the uh, receptors are in our brain and throughout our nervous system. And um, the THC we know makes you, psycho, uh, makes you high, the, the psychoactive part. We're less clear about what happens in the cannabidiol part. And then this was just a, next, this was just a, um, what I thought was fascinating is that how little we know about cannabinoids versus what we've learned about opioids. So next, so THC is excitatory, as I said, antiemetic, antispasmodic. So that's why um, individuals with muscular, um, with MS have been using, um, have been smoking pot for a long time and feeling like it really made a difference for them. They, they were utilizing the THC components. Um, and also, it's the part that um, is effective against glaucoma. So, um, the next one, cannabidiol has broader therapeutic uh, applications, and the most one of the things that, as pediatric pur purveyors and providers, we should be aware of is that it does not affect the short-term memory um, in, uh, as much as THC does, which has very clearly got some short-term memory impairment aspects of it. Um, it has, it decreases, it just sort of makes the limbic system a little less excited, makes things, uh, but it, and it, so it doesn't have uh, the social isolation that can occur when, with pot smokers, with THC users. Um, paradoxically, however, those patients who have social anxiety, um, the cannabidiols tend to help their social anxiety. Um, but then what we do know is that just like with um, pots, so the marijuana plant has both THC and cannabidiols, and we feel that it's the CBD portion that probably creates that anxiety, that the mount, mounting anxiety seen in chronic cannabis users. Um, but its main effect is to inhibit, just like any plant likes to be balanced. So the the purpose of the CBD in the plant is to counteract those excitatory THC aspects. So I, I just like this chart because it just points out that we aren't going to find one perfect drug. CBD or THC is not going to sort of mount, uh, be perfect for every application. So when, um, next, so that, that when Minnesota started looking at making at having uh, dispensaries and uh, labs that would make it. Initially we were told that it was going to be that they were only going to have CBD um, product which as a pediatrician I was really <coughs> happy about um, but as they did more work they realized that that was not going to if, if we've given nine separate types of qualifying conditions um, such as anti, you know, nausea and vomiting. Um, we actually do not have glaucoma as one of Minnesota's qualifiers, but again, a CBD only oil would be in, would not probably be effective. So in Minnesota, you now can, the pharmacist will make a, um, will listen to what you've got going on and then make sort of a blend of CBD, THC, you can get pure THC, you can get pure CBD or a mixture. Now I'm just going to, ask and you don't have to say if you want but does anybody here work at one of these labs I've met several pharmacists now who are moonlighting at this place okay because I was gonna say you should talk instead of me because I'm not certain how they're um, next so Minnesota I mean not Minnesota the United States is very behind other countries especially UK in our scientific endeavor of looking at the world of cannabidiols and um, marijuana in general because it's all Nixon's fault I can blame him for lots of things but basically when the war on when he did the war on drugs and made marijuana uh, uh, what is it the five he's a, it's a five or it's a one I can't remember it's a, one. it's a one so that it's it and heroin live in its own little world altogether so that as a research institution you cannot get 
a, whereas we can do um, research on many, many types of drugs, it's impossible to do research until very recently on marijuana because you can't get the right kind of license, which has implications for all of us as we go forward in this. Um, but I, I'm making it sound like we really understand how uh, CBD works or THC works, but really we don't. Um, this paper was published last year, and this was sort of all of, it was a, a Cochrane review that looked at all of the papers that were, they felt legitimate papers that they could really say, yes, we, and you can see that most of them, although positive, they were really kind of weakly positive or inconclusive, and some clearly were negative. But I think that powerfully, the multiple sclerosis does seem to have some very real effects and certainly makes people feel better and um, has some positive effects on musculature and muscle spasms. And in fact, um, it's neurodegenerative diseases where the most compelling, as opposed to cancer, which is my area of expertise, the neurodegenerative diseases, I think, have the most compelling evidence suggesting that it may actually be very, very beneficial. Um, and Roy could talk because one of the things that we have not studied in this country but has been very well studied in, the, um, in Britain is the concept of the newborn hypoxic ischemic brain damage. So these are babies that are anoxic at birth. You see many of these children then later on, but that they are, um, uh, there's been some fascinating studies looking at the ability to sort of decrease the excitatory stuff that's happening in their brains and has very, it's got potential for long-term improvement. But I'm just imagining you being able, going up to a parent and saying, I just want to try marijuana on your child. You know, I just think that's, it's going to take a lot for us, to, you know, for a brand new baby for us. But I can tell you that the cancer patients are all about this and are very much wanting access to um, CBD, and which is why we decided to sort of approach this in the first place. Other of the um, neurological conditions like um, Huntington's, Parkinson's, and again, multiple sclerosis. Um, and one of the ways that these probably work is with microglial, these um, kind of cells around the nerve cells that they can um, help to improve nerve function and actually help heal nerves. So that would be the case with the anoxic newborns with multiple sclerosis. Um, so um, this was just a very interesting study that was done, sorry, on um, multiple sclerosis and symptom uh, scores. And what was interesting was that if, um, it's a little hard, uh, from this thing to tell, but that if you ask a multiple sclerosis patient, they clearly feel that pain, fatigue, and muscle spasms are better. When they asked physicians or neurologists specifically to measure their spasticity, and there are very specific um, uh, charts and things to, to look at that. They didn't actually see that much improvement objectively, but the patient subjectively feels much better and also, but objectively had higher functioning in, in, in activities of daily living and ability to care for themselves. Um, one of the things that as a state, Minnesota decided initially chronic pain was going to be one of the 10 qualifying conditions. I think for good reasons, they decided to let us see what happens in our state for this year before they um, allow chronic pain to be a, um, a qualifying condition. Because even though there is some specific data, and this is, is part of it, in uh, HIV patients have lots of neurologic pain, neuropathic pain. And we see lots of neuropathic pain related to certain chemotherapy agents as well. So um, cannabis has been well studied in HIV um, patients because they have both a peripheral and a central nervous system neuropathy. And basically, it's a nice painkiller. It's kind of like oxycodone. It's not fabulous. It's not going to change the world, but it definitely has some ability to decrease chronic pain. 
And when, but everybody talks about the risks and the risks of addiction. Well, oxycodone is our most highly um, uh, diverted uh, narcotic these days. It has a very high potential for um, abuse and uh, dependence. So it's not like our other options are fabulous either. So I think that we should be, we need time to look at it, but I don't think we should necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater because our, our opiate choices are not great either. They certainly have side effects. Um, the other thing though that you know most of the studies show that the um, while the effects may be minimal they also have been on research grade which got to tell you is not actually as strong as street grade so people who are using are self-medicating for their pain may get a, a bigger bump than what has previously been available that is not the case with the um, products that are being created in our state though um, so again, the most excitement generated by cannabis has been in pediatric epilepsy. Really, however, there are just um, uh, a couple of uh, very intense, extreme um, epileptic conditions that I'll talk about in a minute, but um, that have been are, have been proven to be even slightly effective. But we think that they work through the different types of receptors with some G, uh, G protein. Um, and um, this is very highly expressed in the hippocampus, which is where these epileptic conditions arise. Um, so certainly in animal studies and preclinical studies, uh, cannabis seems like a very compelling drug to use in this. Um, so a drug was created, Epidiolex, um, which is uh, a oil that is um, THC free um, and it received orphan drug um, designation by the FDA, but only for Dravet and Lennox Gusto syndromes. So we do actually have that study available through our Minnesota Epilepsy Group um, and it's um, hopefully will render us some good data because it's very highly controlled. It's a randomized, double-blinded, controlled study, and that's what we need in order to be able to sort of answer these kinds of questions. But it certainly, if you have it, you can imagine, if you have a child who has been rendered non-functioning because of recurrent seizures, you're going to want to try this, even if it's not a uh, condition that you that it has been approved for. So you can see why people will, would move to Colorado. That was a, um, a very, uh, that was happening a lot. We have not seen that to date in Minnesota. And I don't know if that's just because uh, we're more uh, highly controlled. I think that's probably it. Or whether now you could find a state closer to you to move to because there are 23 states. So. Cancer is, of course, the reason that I became interested in this um, in the first place, because there's some mild, interesting data to suggest that it may um, cause apoptotic cell death. Apoptosis is kind of the end, um, end state for a cell that is dying. And um, cancer may induce apoptosis of certain cancer cells. So that's intriguing. And it certainly has had some um, preclinical work, but if all you had to do was inject a drug into a Petri dish or a, a rat and have it help their cancer, I'd have the Nobel Prize and so would every oncologist. Being able to then move this into true into a true drug form that is going to have a universal application for cancer patients is many, many years off. And so in fact, in this state, cancer by itself is not a condition for um, getting uh, CBD oil. It is cancer with one of the other conditions, chronic pain, um, nausea, wasting. wasting, yeah, lack of appetite. Um, the one place though, the, the one caveat I will say that I think is actually very interesting is that in brain tumors, um, especially gliomas, so gliomas are the most common for, form of brain tumors and it, it ranges of a spectrum from
high grade glioblastoma multiforme. When you think about people with brain tumors, you're generally thinking about people over here with these very aggressive glial tumors. So, and sadly, there is very little effective treatment for these very high grade brain tumors. And in part, the reason for that is that our body is really super good at keeping things from our blood to getting to our brain. That's the blood-brain barrier. What do we know about CBD and THC? It crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it, it's got the vehicle, it's got the, but it definitely can um, impact. One of the ways that tumors work is that it, is they create their own blood cells. That's called angiogenesis. So it appears that CBD is an, has anti-angiogenesis formation. It keeps this tumor from making its own blood vessels. Cancer also loves an inflamed environment, and cancer makes an inflamed environment. So if you have anti-inflammatants, which is what cannabis is, that it might also impact. So it's probably gonna be, again, it's not just one aspect of it, it's the whole plant aspect that might actually, in this case, have a very exciting application. In Minnesota, so pause, take a deep breath, a little bit of a change. Um, in Minnesota, you, you can get it in three forms. You can get it in oil, you can get it in pills, and you can get it as a vapor. And I just didn't want to forget this because in our hospitals, we allow the um, oil or the um, pill, but we do not allow vaporization. Even though I will say that we shouldn't probably be afraid of vaporization, that um, as opposed to when people smoke, it's actually better for you to do this than to smoke. It has lots fewer noxious chemicals um, than smoking. And one of the things they've learned is that it may actually be easier to titrate, whereas if you take a pill, you can have a lot of untoward effects, whereas if you're doing the vapor and you start to feel funny, then you can just stop, or if you get the desired anti-nausea effect, you don't have to have swallowed a pill that's then gonna act for three more hours. So, um, I do talk to my adolescent patients about that it's okay to do vaporization if they're doing that. Um, and then I just wanted to throw the, up this other slide that I found that just says that, you know, yes, we are right now distilling the different um, oils from medical cannabis, but there is a huge body of work going on right now trying to make synthetic cannabinoids. And um, those will, again, potentially have the ability to be even more specific. But as somebody who likes whole foods, and um, we may lose something in the meantime, as we have lost oftentimes when we uh, don't use the whole plant. So the question is whether is this going to be just the panacea, it's going <coughs> to cure everything. And I always, you know, I, I talk a lot about alternative medicine and complementary medicine because cancer patients are being inundated by their friends, their well-meaning neighbors, talking to them about supplements that they should try or, you know, this holy water or this, that, and the other. And I always say, be afraid of things that are magic bullets, right? If something says it can cure diabetes and cancer and your headache, why would that, you know, what would be the common mechanism to make that work? And yet, on the other hand, prednisone is really good for a lot of different things. So you got to be careful in any box that you put things into. So um, you just have to decide whether you're on the side of the snail or the, you know, the early adopter person. And you know, both are right because there's so much we don't know about it. And as pediatric pediatrics people, you know, we have a a, a duty to really be very careful about how we use these medications with our patients, but recognize that all, all drugs have side effects. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Diane. Yeah, you got a so, question? Uh, does GW Pharmaceutical, are they heavily invested in marijuana? That's, if you looked carefully, um, all of the slides are from GW Pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. not, not my They're heavily invested, yes. And, and you know, that's really not a lot different than looking at cost benefit analysis percentages. So, Metamune, oh, yeah. if, if you read the, the studies, 
wonderful one. Well, all about the studies. Oh yes. Outside, they're kind of not really Well, effect. and that's why AAP came came out yeah, with their statement. Yes. Right. So, um, as a pharmacist in the group, I get to talk about the pharmacy aspects of of um, cannabis and. Um, and I'm going to also talk to you about what's going on in the state of Minnesota with the legislature and the uh, companies that are actually producing the product. So, um, you know, Susan did allude to this, is that um, when, there is a difference in whether you take the oral product or you vaporize the product. And, and um, when you take it orally, and the state of Minnesota has said that you can have it in a pill or a liquid form, and so um, the pill or liquid form taken orally only has about a 6 to 20 percent bioavailability. So the dose goes through an extensive first pass metabolism. And so it's very hard to titrate that oral dose. And so um, it really does peak in one to six hours. So you don't see that effect immediately. And I need to do that, don't I? <laughs> Go ahead. And so um, you really don't see that effect immediately. And, um, but it sticks around for a long time, so it does have a long terminal half-life, and that's why, um, and with all of this, it's, it's stored in the adipose tissue, so if you're a marijuana user and you're drug tested, it's going to stay in your system for quite some time. But um, the vaporization is really almost an immediate effect. It doesn't go through that first pass metabolism. And then um, you really see that effect with anywhere between two and, and 10 minutes. And so you can easily titrate the drug if you need to. Um, the inhaled um, is believed to be less psychoactive than, than the oral. And so uh, because of the metabolite that's formed. And so you really do see um, less of that psychoactive component when you inhale the drug. Um, and so then the question is, what sort of interactions does this have? Because it's not well studied, and we don't know what the enzyme systems involved with metabolizing this drug and how it interacts with other drugs. And so part of um, studying a drug is looking at those enzyme systems that metabolize them, and that, that's where we fall a little short with all of this um, cannabis legislation. We really haven't studied the drug um, extensively to know how it interacts with some of the other drugs that we're on. And so um, it, um, it's thought that it may interfere with the CYP3A4 system, but we don't know. But at higher doses, it may <coughs> induce it. And so that's where the study of the drug needs to occur, is how does it interact and what enzyme systems are, that do we use? And we use a lot of drugs that are metabolized by the liver by the enzyme systems. And so um, there are potential, a lot of potential interactions that could occur that we don't know about yet. And um, as um, we get more, uh, more and more body of, of literature, we'll be able to have drug interaction databases to, to say what interacts or what, what doesn't. But at the time, we're kind of left in, in the dark right now. So, um, so then how safe is this? Well, we know that, that um, it's really, really, really safe. And so you'd have to smoke a lot of cannabis to have some sort of lethal effect. So you'd have to smoke 1,500 pounds in 15 minutes. And I don't think anyone can do that. And so that's the LD90 of this drug. So um, it is very safe. It doesn't cause respiratory depression like the opioids. And so, um, but it does have stimulating effects. So it can affect your euphoria. It can affect your perception and cause disorientation, especially um, chronic users over a long period of time. Um, and that is the THC component of this drug. And it can cause confusion and difficulty concentration, <laughs> concentrating. And so that's why um, we're a little cautious in pediatrics because we still have a developing brain. And we know that chronic use over a long period of time can affect some of their learning and some of their um, ability to uh, perform in school. And so that's, that's where we are a little more cautious in the, in the younger children. Um, but um, it also can cause a lot of, um, it, there are a lot of tissue receptors in the body, so it can cause some tachycardia and hypotension, bronchodilatation, so it'll help you breathe better. Um, but um, muscle relaxation for um, some of the gastrointestinal things, and uh, of course, decreased um, gastromotility. 
So as I alluded to, the brain is still developing, and so this is where we're going to take a little bit of caution in using it long-term chronically for our children because um, we do know for a fact that it can cause all of these side effects listed and um, can interfere with learning. So where are we? So it is a Schedule I drug, as Susan said. Schedule I means that it's illegal to prescribe, it's illegal to use. This is federally. The FDA has not made this a um, Schedule II through V legal substance. So it's still in that class of heroin. And Schedule I means that it has a high potential for abuse. And I think that's where we question a lot of that. Is this really a high potential for abuse? And um, the other um, component of this is that it states there is no medical use, no known medical use for treatment in the United States. And so that's where the states are studying it and, and trying to get that body of evidence so we can say, yeah, we do have some medical evidence. Um, and so um, because of the um, Controlled Substance Act, which is um, part of the DEA uh, purview, um, that means that a provider cannot write a prescription for it and um, it will be enforced by the DEA federally if it's caught um, in your possession. And so that means that um, as we go, um, as a physician, you cannot write a prescription for this, even in the state's cannabis program, which I'll get into a little bit later. But um, but what the federal law really states as a Schedule I entity is that we can't dispense or distore it. That's why there's the dispensaries. Um, American farmers can't grow it, so you have to have a specific group of people that are authorized within the state to grow it. Um, Places, once these dispensaries are open, they can't open a bank account because all banks are federally funded. And because this is federal legislation, that's why they only deal in cash. You can't run it through a credit card. You can't run it through a check or a bank or anything. You have to pay cash for this. And so if any of you have seen any of these um, documentaries, like on uh, 60 Minutes, where you see all the cash that's flowing through these Colorado dispensaries, is because they can't run any of that money through bank. And so they have safes in these places just filled with cash and trying to figure out a way to move that, that cash around. Um, the dispensaries can't claim this as a business expense on their IRS because federally you can't claim this. It's a federal program. And then, of course, no healthcare company is ever going to cover this. And so um, you've seen a lot of stuff on the news lately about um, the cost of this. And uh, families can't afford it, and that's true. Um, it is very expensive. In fact, some of these dispensaries are even offering discounts for first-time patients because the enrollment in Minnesota has been much less than it has what they were expecting because of the pure cost of this. And so, um, but on a federal level, there is a little bit of movement. And so on the federal level, there is um, this act that it's the Careers Act. It was introduced in March. It's actually in committee right now. It does have bipartisan support. And so um, both the um, uh, Senate and the um, uh, House of Representatives, <laughs> thank you. Um, both have committee support for this. And so um, there was a little lull over the summer during the recess, but they are back um, looking at it. What they really want to do is reclassify this not as a Schedule I drug, but as a um, Schedule II, III, whatever they, they want to reclassify it as. But they also want to take cannabidiol out of the mix. So if you have pure cannabidiol, which doesn't have the psychoactive effects, then um, um, they want to make that not a scheduled drug at all. And so that's the drug that we're using for seizures and epilepsy. And so, um, but it really is too early yet to determine where this is going to go. But um, they have tried several times to reclassify mar marijuana and have been unsuccessful. And so we'll see where this goes. I do think that it will have more support this go round. So when we look at what is FDA approved, there are a couple of drugs right now that are federally um, approved cannabinoids. And um, dronabidiol, is, Marinol, is what we use in our oncology patients for nausea and vomiting and, and um, 
and wasting disease. And so that is primarily a THC component of the drug. And um, we've been using that for years. It's a Schedule III narcotic. Uh, Nabilone is uh, another Schedule II drug. It's a synthetic THC. And it's also used primarily in the HIV population in uh, nausea and vomiting and wasting disease. Now in England, there is a mixture of cannabidiol and THC. It's a spray that um, orally you spray under your tongue that is currently in phase three trials here in the United States. And so that um, they're being uh, using that or they're testing it for MS. And so that is the drug that currently is being um, studied in the United States for MS. And here are the list of all the states. So well, as Susan said, there are 23 states and the um, Washington DC, which have approved some sort of medical cannabis legislation. There are 10 states that also just have cannabidiol legislation, so taking the THC component out of it. And so it has very limited access to um, what they can purchase. And so in the state of Minnesota, an MD, an APRN, or a PA under the direction of a physician can certify a patient. And so they, um, they can certify the patient um, for the defined characteristics, for the uh, defined certifying qualifications. And so you have to have cancer, but not just cancer, cancer with severe or chronic pain, nausea and vomiting, or cachexia. So you have to have those components with your cancer. Um, glaucoma is a certifying condition in Minnesota. HIV AIDS is a certifying condition. Tourette syndrome, ALS, seizures, and then um, MS, muscle spasms. And you can imagine they have a lot of kids that have tics, muscle spasms, so that is also a certifying condition. Crohn's disease, and then any sort of terminal, what you would define as a terminal illness. So these are the, the certifying conditions in Minnesota. Minnesota hasn't broadened their pain category to all pain. So it has to be pain associated with, with cancer or with um, HIV AIDS. This is what the products look like. And so um, on the left are the pills, and there should be on the labeling the name of the patient, the state of Minnesota. They should also have on the label the patient's number, so um, what number they are in the database, as well as the THC to cannabidiol concentration. So there should be a ratio on that label that says what the, um, um, what the ratio of this THC to cannabidiol is. And so um, it should be labeled so that you could clearly identify this as medical cannabis. The picture on the right is the liquid form. It's just in a, um, and I believe the liquid form has to be refrigerated. And so that's just what it looks like. There are two Minnesota manufacturers. They are, um, Minnesota Medical, and they currently have two plant, two dispensaries open. Each, there are two manufacturers. Each manufacturer has four distribution sites. Not all of the distribution sites are open yet. They weren't ready July 1st when, um, when it became legal. And so um, Minnesota Medical has Egan and St. Cloud open right now. And then Leaf Lime Labs, which is the Bachman Group, has Minneapolis open right now. And they are um, working fast and furiously to try to get Rochester open. So right now in the state, there are three sites open with more to come on board as they get them. You must, um, they can only manufacture in the regular forms, pill, liquid, oil, and um, the vaporization really is legal when you read the legislation for adult patients only, and so not in pediatric patients, and um, no smoking of the plant. So if you're caught with the plant, it's still um, contraband, and so it's still legally illegal to, to have any of the plant form in your possession and um, they can only obtain it from one of these distribution sites. The other key point in this and, and some of the things that we've had in discussion is they cannot carry this across state lines. It has to be within the state of Minnesota. So if you have a patient that is traveling or needs to go another state, it is really illegal for them to cross state lines with that drug. Each state is different. Each state has different laws. And so, um, I know that we've had numerous discussions about what they can and can't do. And so it's probably best not to know. 
So, um, so what are the provider responsibilities? So as I said, a provider cannot write a prescription for this, but they do have, if they want to certify a patient, they do have to register on the site. So they have to go on the site and actually register their um, physician number, their DEA number, where they practice, their address. There are several things that you do to register as a physician. Um, and they have to have primary responsibility and care for that patient. And so um, if you probably heard about earlier, there was a company that came to us, we'll certify you. Well, the state of Minnesota shut them down immediately because they did not have primary care for those patients. So they, they were not primarily responsible for those patients. So patients can't just go to anybody to become certified. And so, um, the, if you qualify a patient, you are also obligated to report annually that the patient still meets that condition. So you are required by the state to submit paperwork that the patient does still qualify and that they don't have any addiction or dependence issues. And then um, as a provider, you're also required to provide education to the family as well. So the, the provider goes online, certifies or registers themselves, and then um, completes all the patient forms. They put in their patient who they want to certify, and then um, that all goes to the state and they get approved for it. So the, um, go to the next one. The next, this is just what it looks like for the providers when they go on site. Um, you have to get a log on, it's just like everything else. You have to um, provide a password and provide all of the primary information. So then the patient goes on site. So the patient has to go on and request to be certified. And so the patient will go online after the provider has said, yes, I will put your name in the database and you will be certified. The patient then goes online. Um, in order for the patient to be approved and get their number, they have to pay 200 bucks to be able to um, become a registered patient. So then they receive, and this is the part that's really flabbergasted to, to me, is that they receive an email saying this is your number. That is the only identification that they get to say that they are in the program. So if they don't have that printed out email, no one knows that they're in the program. You don't get a medical marijuana card that you do in a lot of other states. It's just an email back to the patient saying, yep, you're okay. So then um, they are accepted and they, they pay the, the $200. Then they go into one of the dispensaries. Um, they, the dispensary can look up the patient and then they discuss what sort of product they will be receiving from the dispensary. And so there was a lot of discussion from in the state of Minnesota is how are we going to handle this from a hospital perspective or a, a healthcare perspective if a patient wants to come into our organization and have it on, on our organization. Yes? So, sorry to interrupt. So the dispensary mm -hmm. then essentially decides what, what you're going to get. Formula is going to be just based That's on... Man, my, you know, I'm really happy based on the certifying care. condition, there are some guidelines based on the certifying condition and what the pay, what the discussion is that you have with the family. Gotcha. So, so mm -hmm. knowing very little about this too, so I'll just put that in too. <laughs> so, so um, as a um, as a group. The, the Minnesota Hospital Association got a, a group together to discuss how are we going to handle this if a patient comes into our institutions with medical cannabis because federally it's illegal, we can't handle it, we can't do anything with it, but the patient can. And so are we going to allow them to bring it into our organization and have it and how are we going to handle it? And so as you can see, we pretty much had representation on this collaborative from uh, pretty much every health um, system and I will tell you that these um, these discussions were um, pretty interesting and there was a wide range of opinion from no to yeah we're gonna fully and pharmacy's gonna have it and they're gonna dispense it and so um, in the end we wanted to come up with one standard of how we would all handle it and of course we didn't so each individual system is doing their own and so um, regions and center care don't allow it at all and I should have moved this because Alina doesn't either so Alina is is on the don't allow list children's 
do, does allow it. The pharmacy doesn't handle it. We make it um, the responsibility of the family to store it. We give them a safe in the room. They store it. They administer it. They tell the, the nurse when they administered it. The nurse can document it on a paper record, not in the medical record. And then um, that's how we are handling it. But we, do, we are allowing them to have it in the hospital. Um, and then Mayo, Mayo is actually handling it as a controlled substance. So they are taking full ownership of it and um, storing it in the pharmacy and dispensing it back to the patient. And then there were several that were still undecided. I believe Fairview became the do not allow group, so they, they switched over to the do not allow. And I honestly don't know where Health East or Essentia ended up after um, our final discussions. Yes? Can I, what was the... Um reasoning for not having it, having a paper but not in the electronic Because if you have it in the electronic record, it assumes that you've written an order for it and you cannot prescribe it. So it really is semantics and it really is all about the federal law because we don't want to get caught in uh, violation of federal law. And so we um, will put it on the paper record, we'll scan it into the record, but it, there won't be an actual order for it. So the provider will allow it in their history and physical and say um, we're allowing them to use it. The family signs consent. It's, it's, it's a consent saying that they will take full control over it. And then um, we let them do what they want with it because they know how to administer it, except for vaporization. So, so. If we're, you know, working with you guys to try and get um, access to the medical records. So in the future, when we look at patients' medical records, there will be some sort of record. We back. documented in the problem list, so yes. If we look at chronic problems, it will yeah. say medical cannabis. Right. Actually, at this moment, it says cannabis abuse. We're getting that change, though, because that was the only SNOMED code there was. But so anyway, we're, we're trying to get that changed. But um, it, you will be notified. I mean, it will be on the problem list that they are a cannabis user in our record. Yes. So is this only coming up if the family or patient's asking for it, then? or is it brought up by the physician, just not ordered by the physician? I would say the family is pretty much asking for it. We are not. We do not have any physicians on staff at this point who are saying, oh, we think this is the great drug for you. So it, this is, up, up to this point, it's all been family driven. So, um, so like I said, in our um, policies and goals, we wanted to make sure that we comply with federal and state law. And so we've, we've done workarounds to figure out how we're gonna allow this within our organization. And, and um, at the same time, because there are very strong proponents of this, we wanted to make sure that um, um, we really were, didn't come out in public opinion to be negative in, in this aspect because um, you know, that's bad public relations to your families and, and to the public. So um, we, um, we wanted to minimize that, so we wanted to make sure that we were really kind of uh, in both worlds, I guess. So we do have a medical cannabis certifying committee. It is made up of physicians um, who are on staff at, at Children's who review each record. So a physician, one of the, one of the problems with our um, institution is that um, we felt that there would be an inundation of families trying to to get medical marijuana medical cannabis and that um, the providers feeling that they would be stuck doing it and they would become the marijuana doctor and so we really have a certifying committee by committee and so the um, the provider will submit the patient information to the committee and ask if they agree that this patient would qualify for cannabis. If they do, then the provider then registers the patient. And so we have to have two providers that's on the committee that says, yes, I think that the, this is a, a good thing for your patient and the patient qualifies. And so um, if the committee doesn't approve of it, the family can ask for a vote of every committee member. And if the committee members say no, then they don't have another option at Children's. So we do allow them one extra option. Has that happened? We've not said no, but we haven't had a lot of requests no, we have either. We've only had nine, so this started July 1. Mm -hmm. We've only had nine patients, and they were all cancer patients. And most of them were at uh, with a life expectancy of less than one. Mm -hmm. So it was um, of one year. So um, there hasn't been any disagreement amongst the committee. Um, 
we've actually been very surprised. I've, I've been surprised that it's been as few as it has. So yeah. we, we really haven't had a huge response to this. But for instance, the main problem in Minnesota, the reason that people have not flocked is that most physicians are not approving it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost all align of physicians are just, they're just carte blanche saying no, we're just yeah. And those positions are registered as certifying positions? Nope. They don't, they don't register. Okay. They, yeah, they, they send out a, a survey to all Minnesota physicians, like a mm -hmm. survey, and they ask you, do you are, are you willing to prescribe medical marijuana? And I think, is it 3% or something of physicians? In it was very low. It's very, very low. Mm -hmm. And because nobody wants to assume the liability with it. So well, it's not even that. I think it, it's just that it's, it is untried. It is unproven. And unproven. Yeah. And so people are are anxious about it. But the way that the Minnesota, from, from my point of view, as somebody who, um, I will, I am a certifier, but I and all of my partners have agreed to be certifiers, but we, um, I got a phone call from Mayo that the patient wanted to come up so that, and none of the Mayo physicians would do it. So would I prescribe? And I'm like, no, I, I won't, I'm, you know, unless that patient wants to, transfer care to me, mm -hmm. which the patient was at end of life, and I'm like, that would be a bad thing. You don't want to disrupt somebody's care at their end of life. You know, maybe you guys should rethink your position right. because um, we won't take somebody just so that they, you know, because, and when you said we didn't want to be known as the main as the marijuana doctors, mainly I didn't want to become known as the marijuana doctor. You weren't the only one, <laughs> <laughs> So, so the really question is, well, what does this hold for us? And, and um, it's being studied in all sorts of disease states, all sorts of body parts. And um, will, it, will it cure it or will it just create new ones? <laughs> <laughs> so can we now study it? Like on that last slide, because so I know part of the legislation was this would study it in mm -hmm. Minnesota, right? Well, yeah, so we will be submitting data. Yeah. Yeah. And Just that at the end of the year, you're supposed to say how your patient did. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty not great. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think the American Academy of Pediatrics has been pretty clear. They're very much against it. Yes, they are. Because you have, I mean, this is extremely unusual to fast track a drug that's mm -hmm that is a controlled substance and let people use it. And this was public that drove this. Right. And I understand, you know, if you have a child who's having 30 seizures a day and it's impacting, you, you, you would do anything for your child. But the American Academy of Pediatrics point is that it, it needs to be studied like this uh, when you're doing lennox Gastaut syndrome mm -hmm. or with Trave syndrome to see if you actually get some real benefit. Are they doing it as a crossover study, do you know? Or? I know it's placebo controlled, so I you think they, I don't know if it's crossover. It, um, I don't think so. I don't think it is. No, I don't think it is. And I think it's a 12 week study and um, they're collecting that data. There's actually, I think there's three different arms to that study. And we don't know much about it because it's done through Meg and um, they don't cross over to us. Yeah. But so we would like to do research on it. I would actually like to do a trial. Mm -hmm. But we would have to change our, we would have to get some special dispensation. Yeah, so what Meg did is they got a Schedule One license. They had the DEA in there and they evaluated their setup. And so in order to study it, you have to go through the regulatory process and get the proper licensure, which they did, and um, which I don't think was that big of a deal, but they had to show that they could control it, um, not have diversion, that sort of thing. So who's currently paying for the drug? $200 is just for the... The patient is paying for the drug. So I will tell you, you pay $200 just to be in the program. Oh, the and then program. on a monthly basis, it's anywhere from $200 to $400 a month. And no family can afford that. And that's why um, there's been a lot of press lately about how expensive this drug is and, and normal people just can't afford this. Insurance isn't paying for it. And so they came out and said, well, for first time in, First time users, we're gonna we're gonna give you a fifty percent discount, but that's just one time. This is very expensive. It's not cheap. They were complaining that our prices compared to like Colorado is way inflated. So and I, I believe that's probably the reason why we don't have a lot of patients in there because people can't afford it. 
so the uh, two pharmaceutical companies are involved in the manufacture. Uh, they're not. They're not in the red, obviously. They're in the no. black. Right. So is, does anybody know what kind of I don't know. they make out of this? I don't. Are they from here? Huh? The ones from here? Yeah. I think they've been very disappointed. They have been, they but have I don't not, know what they're doing. They have I don't know. They made a lot of money. Right. They probably have invested heavily they have into the manufacturing oh my gosh. aspect yeah. and then right. non -profit. Yeah, I think they're going to have to bring their prices down. I, they're going to have to become more competitive because, um, well, I just saw a news report. The guy said, I'm going to go out and buy pot on the street because it's, it's like a fifth of the cost of what I'm paying at one of these dispensaries. So they're going to they're gonna send people out to the street to get it if they don't come down. Yeah. Does the manufacturer control the price or the state? No, the manufacturer. Yeah. And then the people that decide the concoction, are they chemists? Or they are pharmacists. Okay. They are pharmacists. So um, personally, I have no education in marijuana. <laughs> so I, uh, I don't know what sort of training they got. This all went through very quickly. Um, I do know that there are protocols and there are guidelines. Um, I think over time they'll get that experience. But right now, I, I think it's still a little iffy. Yeah. You know, I just, I just saw a study that was published where they compared um, MRIs and for long-term chronic use, mm -hmm. and, now and it does affect certain regional growth right. of the brain. I mean, there are differences. Right. Anatomical differences. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the concerns that we have because we've put it out there and we're not studying it yeah. like we should be. Yeah. Do you have a question? I thought there was an income sliding scale for families. So if you're already on the uh, Disabilities Act, um, you do get somewhat of a discount for the fee that you pay. I don't know that you get a discount for purchase, though. And one last thing, uh, Gillette is also on the self-administration. They are, OK. And everyone, this is Todd Dahlberg from Gillette. I don't know he's with their team. I'm probably just with Gillette. So are the pharmacists that are working in the dispensaries, are they then essentially breaking federal law and could would yes, the, they are. the pharmacy <laughs> <laughs> so they are breaking federal law, and um, but the state, um, it's very specific in the state legislation, uh, the wording on it is that the state boards cannot go after those people working within the confines of the state law. And so they, were, they wrote that in specifically to protect the workers that are actually in the dispensaries. And also any um, any nurse or provider in a um, institution where uh, a patient is bringing it in, they can't um, prosecute there either. But that doesn't mean you can't prosecute on the federal level. That's why it's this is such a um, it's a balancing act because the DEA could still come in if they wanted to. And then um, we also talked a lot about CMS because we're all CMS certified, and so um, we get our payment through CMS, which is federally funded and so we're, we're walking a really fine line and that's what all of the MHA conversation was is you know what's Joint Commission going to do what's CMS going to do are they going to come after the states individually do the, the 23 states that you said have <clears throat> laws similar to what we are their legislators working on this federal bill including Minnesota do, or are they getting resistance from the middle? There are several. You know, the, the opinions widely vary. vary. There are several state um, legislatures that are working on the bill. I think that last time I looked, there were 12 or 14 people um, on the committee that were proponents for the Careers Act to, to declassify it as a um, Schedule One drug. And so there are, um, it's getting support, but there's also a lot of detractors, too. So it's, um, it's not going to be an easy road, I don't think. Are there other drugs that they might be matching up besides marijuana that they might pair up with to try? Not that I'm aware of. Get it off the Schedule 1? Not that I'm aware of, no. So where do you think this will be 10 years from now? Oh, I think it'll be like alcohol, and you'll just go in and, and um, buy it in a liquor store. I do. But um, it, it's... Um, it's going to go through a lot to get there, but I do think it's going to get there. But I, I do think that there will be medical grade. 
there will be medical grade, yeah. And there'll be drugs and they'll, you know, these GW pharmaceuticals will be putting out their drugs for, that are high in cannabidiols that um, will be legitimate drugs for treatments. So I can't remember which one of you guys mentioned the medical grade versus the street grade or some of the studies have been using weaker. Mm -hmm. So right now the Minnesota grade is the same as street grade in general there? No, it's, it's more pure. Okay. So, um, so the way they're distilling it and processing it, it it's a more purified form. So I, I think um, it, should have good. it should have good results, yeah. If it's going to have good results, it should have. Do I have another question over here? Can physicians certify across state lines? Get it, because they can't take it home with them. Legally. Legally. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that Fairview said no, but I, um, I, I think they finally came to the, con they were at first on board to have the pharmacy control it, but I think in the end they said no, that they wouldn't allow it in their organization, very similar to Alina. Nope, they were having their staff dispense it. They're controlling it in the ADMs on the units, so they're pulling at the, um, the nurse or whoever is taking care of the patient is pulling it out of the ADM. So is the pharmacy buying it then, or are they getting it from the family? Nope, we cannot buy it. So it comes in, it's like a home med, comes in with the family, gets put, controlled, and sent back with the family when they leave. So the only way you can get it is a family through a dispensary. That's it. The children's made the right. So essentially no children's staff touches it. Right. We give them a locker and they put it in their locker. And how do you send the Pharmacy verifies it and the parents dispense nursing documents based on approval report. Okay. Do we, Very I similar. think the nurses verify it. Yeah, the nurse, who's ever the admitting person right. verifies it. And you have to have it, we have some very specific stuff like, you know, you have to have the patient's name on it. It has to be the right name. You have to be, well, that's the other thing is not everybody can be the giver. Right. You're, You're a the care, you have to certify as the caregiver. Right. So if your kid is staying with grandma, grandma's not supposed to give it. Only you are supposed to give it. Um, are they finding it hard with studies to, if the pharmacist at the facility Oh, I would think so. Yeah, I mean, it's not a very controlled study. <laughs> so it's really, uh, um, you know, I don't think there'll be great studies that come out of here, but at least we'll get a idea of, of its effect. It'll be a descriptive. If yeah. there's anything that gets published, it'll be simply descriptive. Like. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what usual phase two studies do is mm -hmm. determine uh, dosing and efficacy. Yeah. I'd be curious to know, I've heard a lot of um, disbelief from, I think, the general public, especially people who don't work in that profession, about, oh, this is a joke, people just want to be a leader. Um, a lot of just not really believing it's helpful that it would work. What do you guys usually say to people like that? You want to go, Susan? Yeah, I, I say <laughs> it's an area that we don't know that much about, but there are some. But it, any, I mean, I, I'm used to talking to people about complementary and alternative stuff. And, you know, if something is like laetrile and it's clearly without, it's been studied. But if something hasn't been studied, I don't know whether raspberry hips are helpful or not. So I'll say, we just don't know. It's not studied. Or in this case, I can say, there are some preliminary studies which are intriguing or interesting. Um, but... You know, and then it would depend on the patient. But your baby is six months old. We don't know what effect it would have on a six-month-old child. And we know for a fact that marijuana certainly has deleterious effects. So you, you try and lay it out as, as much as possible. I mean, that, I, I feel really lucky in that in our nine patients out of our entire, that I've wanted it, there really wasn't any, I didn't, you know, clutch at my chest going, ooh, I feel conflicted. No, you know what, 
I didn't have any problem. The times actually that the, we actually have several adolescents who smoke pot all the time, right? And so they say, oh, I want this marijuana. I'm like, okay, I'd rather you use this with, with a lower THC with less noxious chemicals than smoke bud, which is what they're, and, and getting it illegally off the street. I will say that after a couple months, both of these guys are like, it's too expensive. I'm just gonna go back to getting it on the street. And I've learned new language all the time. <laughs> yeah, the bud, Susan, that was oh, pretty but, good. No, 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 it's dab. They make their own dab, which is they make their own oil. They, they distill it with butter. I guess you, oh. you, <laughs> and you make it into so yeah. put it into brownies and distill with. <laughs> <laughs> seems like an area where there could be disagreement, but um, I think in each of these cases, people are desperate for hope, and they just want to try something, and in which case I'm like, oh. You think anecdotally, you've seen, right on for question from what you've already said, but can anecdotally have you been um, optimistic about what you've seen in your patients? Um, no. I mean, I don't feel optimistic at this point in terms of it lengthening life or having an anti-cancer. Do I think that there are patients who have chronic, like I, one of the terrible things about acute lymphoblastic leukemia treatment is that adolescents can get something called avascular necrosis of the hips and joints where they're basically their joints dissolve and they're in extreme pain. And so, yes, I do think that they have some pain relief and they feel better, and they feel more euphoric. But what's the trade-off? You know, if they become stoners and they are happy just to smoke pot and not figure out a different way of handling their chronic pain, have we done them? I, you know, these are, these are highly convoluted and complex questions that I don't know the answer. And, and I, you know, who am I also to say, Hey, you're not handling your pain well. You've got to do it this way. People do what they have to to get through life, but I, I don't want to be the one. I, you know, I, I have to be careful about what I say and what I do. So it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. It already has been. Mm -hmm. um, changing subject a little bit. Um, as far as the dosing goes, um, do they, like, if they want an increase in dose, is this something that you go to? who are providing it and request it, and they can approve or deny yes. it. Yes. That's how mm -hmm. It's strictly up to the dispensary on the dose, or the change in dose, or the form of dose. Dispensary decides that? Yes. Is there a conflict of interest on that? Where they could say, hmm, we need, you know, the cash flow's a little low, maybe you need to increase your dose a little bit. Um, I would hope they're a little more ethical than that, but um, I suppose you could say it could be. <laughs> but they're not the owners. They, they just work there, so um, I would hope not.